investigative journalism is at the heart of this program and the heart of this next story. It's one that I've been working on for the past couple of months and broadcast earlier this week on CBC News. Whenever Shanaz Azarbaki leaves her house, there's one question that always goes with her. What would happen if her heart were to suddenly stop? I don't want to be revived. Azarbahi, who's 67, has decided she doesn't want paramedics to administer CPR or other types of resuscitation. So I went looking for, to see what my options were. Hospitals are used to dealing with do not resuscitate orders or DNRs, but what about when people want that option if something were to happen at work or at home? So these are the forms that I got from the uh, Ministry of Health. As Arbaki and her family doctor filled out what's known as a DNR confirmation form. But there's a problem. Turns out this Ontario government form with its official serial number isn't actually connected to any registry. And first responders haven't been given any guidance on where to look for it. A paramedic's first response will be to initiate care until the documentation is found. Azarbahi is so fearful paramedics won't see it, she's taken to wearing it around her neck, even posting it on her wall. And my son comes in and he looks at it and he says, Mama, this looks so morbid. Alberta has a green sleeve program directing first responders to look on the fridge. Quebec has a registry, though it's not clear if first responders can easily access it. Prompting many, including Azarbahi, to call for a national strategy so she doesn't need to be fearful that in her final moments, no one will be able to find the form. Now that story exposed some gaps in the way that DNR orders are handled across the country. And out of frustration, Azarbahi has resorted to an extreme way to make sure that paramedics know she does not want to be resuscitated. She invited us into a very personal moment to show you what she does. Shana, show me what you sometimes do. Uh, I actually write on myself. You can see how many times I must have done it so that I'm so used to it. Why do you do this? Just in case if I'm on the street, on the road somewhere, and I don't have the form, at least somebody knows. Even if they don't look at anything, DNRC means please do not touch me. Do you feel that you have any choice but to do no. this? None whatsoever. It's so, it's, 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 I lo I hate myself because it's so, it, it has no, no, I have no self-respect left. I'm literally, seems so extreme. If they had a proper system in place, I wouldn't be doing this. Do you think I enjoy it? Do you enjoy seeing me doing this? I don't think so. From the look of your face, no. Listen, as a reporter, I know when you see that, I've got your attention. You're going to watch and listen to that story just to find out why she's doing that. But as a journalist, I also need to be sure that I'm not exploiting her and that she really understands just how much privacy she's giving up to make her point. It's an issue journalists often grapple with. Harriet calls me. Come to the hospital, she says, to film what may be a final scene. Hey, Harriet. Hi, Duncan. The CBC's Duncan McHugh got an intimate glimpse into the lives of terminally ill patients for a documentary series about the debate over medically assisted dying. Just a personal question because at some point I'm going to be sitting with my mom. What, for, for when Adam comes, what, what, do you, what do you want to share with him? Just say I love him, but she knows. Duncan and his crew chronicled Harriet Scott's final days. They were in the room as she had her last moments with her family. In the best son in the world. So how do reporters balance getting what they need to do their jobs with the privacy of the people whose stories they are telling? Duncan, this is a challenge for us all when we deal with stories where we're really in someone's personal private space. How did you test whether Harriet really understood how much privacy she was giving up? It was, right from the beginning, it was awkward for me because we were there 
expressly with the purpose to follow her until she died. I, I knew she was dying. We knew she was dying. That was why she was chosen to be a subject of the piece. And, and so when I first met Harriet, it was awkward. We're here to follow you until you die. Um, Harriet was incredibly comfortable and open about talking about her death. And so, so that, made, that, that made me comfortable about talking about death with her, even though I'd never met her before. And then suddenly we're into this relationship where she and I got into very intimate space very quickly talking about life and death, literally life and death issues. And yet this is a couple years ago already. Mm -hmm. And as you watch the tape and as I watch you now, I can see the emotion you <laughs> still feel about your part of that experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we did get very close as you do when you follow anybody over a couple of months. I, I, I make it, uh, it's really important to me that I check in uh, with my story subjects regularly to remind them that I'm not your friend. I'm a reporter. I'm here to observe uh, as objectively as I can. But of course you get close to people and, and watching Harriet was so intimate with us sharing those last moments and so I asked that question about my mother because I could see my mother you know I, I got that close to and, her. And as a reporter I, I see that moment I hear you asking it and I think good for you because I'm not sure I could have gotten it out mm -hmm. and yet it's the question to be asked in that moment but when it's you sitting there it's hard to find that space between journalist asking the question and person feeling that moment. The other challenge with that is that is that typically when someone is dying and they're calling out to people for support, they're asking for encouragement and so people will show up and say, oh you're looking well, are you doing well, are you going to make it? Or you're... And I was there to, to film her on the rough days as well and so we showed up one day for a day that we had set up, she couldn't get up off the couch. And I know that Harriet was conscious about that. She said, I don't know if we should be filming today. And I said, Harriet, this is how you're feeling today. We should film it. And so we did. And, and I know that she wanted people to see how tough it was. You work as a journalist. You're the host of Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio. You are also a journalism prof. Mm -hmm. What do you tell young journalists about how to handle these very difficult very personal moments. The, the most important thing to me is that, is that you, I tell students is, is to be transparent. Uh, as often as possible, check in with your subject and, and know that they understand what you're filming, why you're filming it, and, and what your thoughts are as you're filming it. But, but we get close to people. Harriet's family invited me to speak at their funeral. Mm. And at her funeral, and, and that was a difficult moment for me. The piece had not yet gone to air. But I realized that I had become part of their family in many ways, and I had become part of her dying process. And so to me, it was the right thing to do, to go and speak when they asked me to speak. And, and, and I think that's the most important thing for journalists, and I tell this to journalism students. I need to be able to sleep at night. I need to be able to do the right thing. Thanks for putting that in words for all of us who do this job, because it's a part of our experience that people don't often see or think about. Thank you. Thanks, Diana.